special guest today. You know, here at the garage apartment, we might be based in sports, but we talk about everything, man. Got a very, very talented brother who I met a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was so impressed with this gentleman. I was like, man, you got to come on the show, man. You got to come on the show. So, without further ado, we got author, professor, and vice president of the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement, Dr. Leonard Moore. Dr. Moore, welcome to the show. Brother, thank you, man. How y'all doing? Well, man, uh, let's start right there, man. What exactly... The, 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 the division of diversity and community engagement, what exactly is that and what does that entail? Well, man, in 2007, University of Texas, y'all know it is UT, created, the, created a whole new operation, man, and it's called Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. So basically, man, I manage about 40 programs and initiatives and centers, um, got about 500 employees up under me, and I also manage three auxiliaries, number one, uh, the, the UT charter school system, I got, I run that and also run the Hog Foundation for Mental Health. We give out about $15 million a year for mental health. We just gave out $5 million in inner city of Houston this past year. Um, and also, man, the UIL, so the big Texas High School Athletic Association. Those are three big auxiliaries I run that I run about 40 programs specifically on campus, man. Well, let me ask you this, because uh, one thing that yes, I sir. found very interesting in, interesting in you is you explained that you weren't necessarily uh, uh, a great student in high school. No, man. No, man. I, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, man. I finished high school with a 1.6 GPA. I'm a, I'm, I grew up in a community kind of like what, Missouri City, something like that. Okay. Uh, you know, middle-class black community. My dad was college educated. My mom, my mom wasn't, man. But I had a 1.6 GPA. And it wasn't because I was dumb. It was just I just wasn't engaged in school. But I went to Jackson State University, man, in Jackson, Mississippi. And, man, but, you know, I owe those folks a whole lot, man. They got me right, you know. And left there, man, went and got a Ph.D. at Ohio State at the age of 26. I was a professor at LSU for nine years, and I've been at Texas for the last for the last 13 years, man. So one thing I tell parents, man, and college counselors, man, don't you know, don't judge a kid's future by their GPA or their test score. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, man, will, man will never be able to, uh, in many ways, come up with an instrument or a test to determine what God has called somebody to do. You feel me? So we got to quit doing that to our kids, man. So now you you went into something. So I was getting ready to ask you. So what was what what made your switch go off? What was it that intrigued you that made you realize you know what? Let me get a little bit more serious about academics and what man, I'm trying to do. Dahar, here's the thing, man. I need to do a conference with with a bunch of black parents, man. Because you know when you come out of high school, you're told when well, you made your this, you'll make money. You made your that, man. And the only thing I've ever loved in my life was black history. Okay, that's it. Never love anything else. Okay. And so I went to Jackson State, man. I was a history major, man. And, you know, man, it just came alive. Here's what I tell all the students, man. When you take classes that you enjoy, it makes you sharper all the way around. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Uh, but too often, man, we got kids coming to Texas, going to A&M, going to PVTSU. They not majoring in what they like. They majoring in something just because somebody told them they can make a lot of money in it. Okay. And my thing is this, man, if you're not good at something, leave it alone. Right. And I think, man, a lot of us are in bad marriages, a lot of us are bad parents, and a lot of us are just miserable people because we don't like what we do for a living. So so how much would you in, 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 in would you say that is because of the environment that we are in, or how much of it is it from the misinformation or the further perpetuation? Of misinformation and, and or simply just not being uh, uh, aware of what's needed. Man, I'll say this, man. We as black folk, we ain't got no excuses, man. We got access to all kinds of information. And brother, I didn't realize how privileged I was as a, a black American till I went all across the globe. You see what I'm saying? And so for me, man, we just got to begin to sit down and have questions with our kids, man, about you know. 
What do you like to do? How do you want to earn a living? You see what I'm saying? Right. And I tell students that most of us will major in something in college and go do something else professionally. So, man, just major in what you love and just, just ball out doing that. So, man, that is just that is my philosophy. But my biggest frustration with a lot of our parents, man, and I want you all to hear me on this, is that we don't set our kids up for success. How many of you all have ever heard parents say, well, no, my kid, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to pay for my kid to go to college. I had to work my way through. They're going to work their way through, and that way they, you know, they got to bring something to the table. Here's the way I look at it, man. My dad, he, had, he, worked, full, he worked at the post office full-time. He went to college part-time, but still graduated in five years. Okay. His whole thing as a parent was, well, he said, my responsibility is to make sure that I, that I fully fund my kid's college education. And so if you think about it, he paid for me to go to college. I didn't have to work. Now, my generation, what I should be doing for my kids, I should be able to – I should be generating wealth for my family. But too often, man, we always start in the cycle off at zero. Right. That's why in Houston you'll find a school teacher and a plumber, a white school teacher and a white plumber living, living in the neighborhood with a house for $500,000 sell for $500,000 a year, but they sit next to a black cardiologist a sister who's a cardiologist, and a brother who's a dentist. And yeah. you're like, how the hell do they live here? They're only making $90,000 a year. Yeah, that's that old Chris <laughs> Rock joke about uh, his, uh, uh, his neighbor being a dentist, his white neighbor, and his black neighbors were Mary J. Blige, Gary <laughs> Sheffield, and Jay-Z. And right, <laughs> that's it, that's it. <laughs> so now let me, cause, because because you were saying how students need to major what they love. Well, you know, of course, along with majoring in what you love, how much of that also is because we don't have enough information about finance and we aren't passing on wealth and legacy to our generation. So, I mean, sometimes somebody has to then pursue something outside of that, right? Like, so for example, if you do not love finance, but in order to okay. truly set yourselves up and set up uh, inheritance for your children's children, as Scripture says, right? right? Somebody has right. to then go get some information about finance and 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 uh, um, uh, uh, some some form of financial literacy and banking or something of that nature. Absolutely, you ain't got a major in it. I mean, brother, this, this, I tell my students, man, this, these phones we got in our pocket. Hey, I've been to Dubai, China, South Africa, Australia. Wherever I go, man, the phone works. And, and what's amazing about the Internet, brother, is that everybody now has equal access to information. This is true. You know what I'm saying. Absolutely. Some of us, and I admit, there are some things I'm lazy about. You right. see what I'm saying? So I'm not putting on everybody else, man, but we just got to begin to change the conversation around college going. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Because too often the message black kids get is different than what, than what wealthier kids get. Um, on that same note, uh, when you said you were sort of a lackluster student at the beginning and then kind of yeah. it kind of clicked in there with you, um, were your parents involved in that, in, in that um, I guess, educational process, or was that just a life? <laughs> no, I mean, not really. I mean, Jackson State, the folks at Jackson State weren't telling me I had, they weren't telling me nothing new. They were just reinforcing what my parents were telling me. But sometimes, man, it takes an outside voice. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. Just, Unfortunately, just speak, just it does. Speaking to your life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, so we never, sometimes too often, we don't look at our parents as heroes. We just look at them as parents That's not right. realizing That's right. the things and, that they and, have and sacrificed. Man, you know, I've, I've worked at two large white universities, LSU and Texas. But I'm here to tell you, man, the HBCU, the track record of HBCUs and taking brothers like me, you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, a diamond in the rough, that track record is unparalleled. So I hate when I hear black folk down in TSU and down in PV. Man, without HBCUs, you don't have a black middle class at all. Exactly. And we got to remember, before Texas and A&M and Ohio State and LSU would take us, guess what? It was Southern, Grambling, J-State, Alcorn, PV, and TSU. Absolutely. So there's a push um, that I've noticed. Uh, this is a mod day. Uh, I'm a... Um... <clears throat> I'm involved in a lot of youth sports, uh, basketball, uh -huh. and football, and there's a push in the community that's getting a lot of pushback of uh, sending our young men and young women who are athletes uh, back yeah. uh, to HBCUs. There was a gentleman by the name <laughs> of Bubba Thomas that wrote a book many years ago <laughs> called NCAA. It's a National Collegiate Affirmative Action. 
And in that book, huh, right, right. he talked about um, how the uh, white schools, they uh, lower the standards for uh, black athletes, particularly black male athletes in basketball and football. Um, but right. those same standards aren't lowered or adjusted to let uh, the run-of-the-mill black student in. Um, so Absolutely. what do you think about but, but that? I'll say this, I'm saying they, they lower the standards all the way around for any athlete. And I'll give you an right. example. <laughs> Uh, the University of Pennsylvania was recruiting my daughter for basketball. And, you know, it's an Ivy League school. Right. And my daughter's SATs were in the low 1300s. So I was like, man, can she get in with this? <laughs> he said, if your daughter was on our team right now, her SAT score would be in, in the middle of the team. It would be in the middle. Right, right. And I've heard a brother say, if, if your daughter can play volleyball or basketball or softball or swimming and they got 1,000 SAT, they can go Ivy League if they're good enough. Right. So I think it's lower for everybody. But I understand but I understand your point. You know, I've known kids who uh well, not kids, they're grown men now, but uh some of my contemporaries uh -huh. back when I was playing, uh one in particular who came from my high school and went off to Dartmouth on that. Um, but he wasn't yeah, able man. to make it. And uh he was back right. after one year. Um wow. you know. Okay. Uh so uh with that, um uh and uh I watched a bit of your lecture earlier about um, how you helped those students at LSU, uh, those kids yeah. that didn't know that they could be. And I thought it was interesting how you had the guys call out, what's your favorite play? Right. What do you do on that play? And how they just ripped through it with exactly. no problem. And how they had Absolutely. no idea that they're using, I mean, vernacular and uh, uh, critical you know, thinking skills, critical thinking and, skills and, and thinking fast and that they actually, the sport that they play is very intellectual. Uh, Very intellectual, yes, sir. Right. So how do you get those kids to transfer that intellectual and to believe in themselves intellectually to learn a whole playbook, which you know is huge, and transfer right. that into the classroom? Man, here's the tough part, man. And so when I was at, I was at Jackson State from 89 to 93 and then at Ohio State, 94 to 98. What I, the big difference I noticed between now and then is back then, man, athletes had a whole bunch of free time. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They pledged fraternities, pledged sororities, they'd be at the parties. They were actively engaged in the life of the campus, all right? And even at LSU, my first year, first year at LSU, man, but something happened, man, with these coaches now, man. They just, they just control all their time. So, man, the brothers and sisters don't even have time to do anything else. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because these coaches want them in the facility all day long. And I remember LSU opened up, LSU this guy had a new locker room built, and Texas had a new locker room built, and they built these football-only facilities. And I told the brothers, man, that's not a good, that's not good for you. Mm. And I've heard several coaches say across the country, if you're not at class, you need to be in this facility to help us win a national championship. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, nah, brother, when, when, when they're not in class, they need to be going to meet with professors. You know, they need to be, when they're not in practice, they need to be developing other aspects of their identity so although these brothers are intellectual and all they are smart, although football is an intellectual enterprise, man, they don't have time to do nothing else. Right, right. Yeah, and I noticed that in my undergrad uh, life that the athletes, um, you know, when you read about, you know, I read about John Carlos and, and, and you know, all of those guys back when they were at uh, San Jose right. State and how they were actually, and, and, and even Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, other guys during the movement, who were athletes, right, right. and they were a part of the black student experience. Right. But now those guys Absolutely. are so segregated away from the other black students, You, I mean, you halfway don't know any of them except for their own field exploit. Man, when I left LSU in, in 07 to come to Texas, they were just building a football – they were building a football-only facility uh, across the street by the baseball stadium. It was about a 10-minute walk, about a 15-minute walk from the football facility to the main part of campus. And this was, this was, so Nick Saban was the one that kind of designed it. Man, do you know that they wanted to put classrooms in that facility? Wow. And we were like, hell no, because I knew what was going to happen. Right, right, right. At some point, they were going to have professors coming over there teaching classes. Right. And the one thing, man, that a lot of parents need to have on their radar is a lot of these high-profile athletes now are taking a lot of online classes. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I know. Now, don't get me wrong. Maybe, maybe one online class semester is okay. But I think what you what you are finding at some of these schools in the South where football is big, these brothers in 75, 80 percent all online classes, man. Never in the classroom. Never walking out of. Never in the, the classroom. Bathroom. 
Never that's walking out of Monday. Never walking out. That's how Justice right. Never engaging with a professor, never engaging with a staff member. Whenever I see a high-profile athlete, Texas, LSU, USC, wherever, I ask, I ask them one question. I said, I'll give you $100 right now if you could if you could give me a list of three references, people that work at your university who don't work in athletics. Mm-hmm. And, and how, they can't so, do it. I would say, so I, what would you say the percentage of them being able to do that is? 5%. Oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. So, let, <laughs> <laughs> so Doc, let me ask you this. So um, would you say that it is, is it, is it systemic or is it just simply that athlete, the athletic departments are under so much pressure to win that they're just jaded about actually uh, 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 educating the whole student holistically or educating the let student me, holistically? Let me tell you this, man. It ain't the NCAA. It ain't the system. It ain't the university president. It ain't the athletic director. It's the head coach. The head coach at all these schools has all the power. Two years ago, I was at the Final Four in San Antonio speaking to 40, 40 of the top assistant men's basketball coaches. So these guys are about to, they about to get D1 head coaching jobs in the next three or four years. Right. I said, why don't you require that the young men show up, that, that, that in order for them to practice, they got to have a resume. Mm-hmm. Man, they don't, nobody want to do it. I said, why don't you make them join a student organization? Why don't you make them get an internship? And the brother said, Brother Mukon said, oh, Doc, man, they're not interested in doing that. I said, they're not interested in getting up at 5 a.m. to lift weights. Would you yeah, make them right. do that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so indeed. my point is I told the coach, you make them do everything that benefits you and your family. But you don't make them do anything that, that, ben- that, that, that benefits them and their family. Right. Now, another interesting thing that I saw and uh, something else that I also knew uh, about yeah. uh, the um, process is that, you know, a lot of people talk about these athletes and, well, why don't they graduate and, 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 and why don't they go on to, you know, to use their uh, connections that you would get because, you know, at the University of Texas, just being an alumni there, that's part of the reason why you go somewhere like that is just to be a part of the alumni network to get jobs later on, right? But okay. um, uh-huh. you mentioned that um, – these guys are not allowed to major in whatever they want to major in. Like if I came in and I say, well, I want to go pre-med, I want to major in biology, and there's obstacles to that. Can you explain that a little bit? Here's the deal. Now, let me take it back. I wouldn't say not allowed, but here's the dilemma. If you got a football or a basketball or a softball or baseball commitment from 1.30 to 5.30 every day, right? and you major in biology or chemistry or, or political science, stuff like that, and your major classes are at 1.30, 2.30, and 3.30. Mm-hmm. It's conflict. You see what I'm saying? Oh, definitely. So it's not like they're allowed to. It's, it's, just a, it's structural. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And that's why I tell coaches to be honest with these young men and women on the recruiting visit. You know? Right. My daughter's going to play basketball in Incarnate Word in San Antonio. Okay. And we took them. And she also had an offer from uh, Louisiana Lafayette. And I told the coaches, don't lie to us. Just tell my daughter what the commitment is like. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And they told her, Jocelyn, you won't be able to do everything every other student does. And I appreciate that level of honesty. Mm-hmm. But too often, man, these parents are going on these recruiting visits. They see in that stadium. They put them in a little golf cart. And the parents, man, not only do they not know, the parents don't even know what questions to ask. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Parents ask them questions about playing time and, what position my child gonna play? That's the most important <laughs> thing. That's the most important thing to him. Yes. So now. Right, right. But go ahead, man. I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. So I'm saying. So it's structural. So that's why you know you know I tell parents you know ask if your son wants to go to Wisconsin to play football, go to UCLA. You know, does does the football schedule conflict with the chemistry curriculum? Right. And if it does, you got two choices: change your major, or well, or scratch UCLA UCLA off the list. Right. So you are listening to the Garage Department. We are here each and every Sunday night from 6 to 8 Central Standard Time. We have Dr. Leonard Moore on the line, Vice President of the Division of Diversity and Communication Engagement. So now, Dr. Moore. Uh, Yes, sir. So I was just wondering how do you feel that it's the same way or it would appear from the outside looking in that it's the same way even if it's an African-American coach? 
Um, and it would appear it's the same me, way at me, certain can, HBCUs. Would you say that it's kind of just a football thing? Let me tell you this, man. I met a lot of black coaches in my day, and I've met two that have been unique. Shaka Smart and Charlie Strong. You hear me? Yes, it did. <laughs> I've met two that have been unique. And, ne and we, we know what right happened with Charlie, and we're going to leave that alone. We just <laughs> we saw what happened there. <laughs> no, but my point is, but, but, but what I appreciate about Charlie and Shaka, they realized that as a black man, yeah, it ain't good. just about them winning a bunch of games. Right. right. You see what I'm saying? Right. right. They understand that those young men, when they leave there, they're they going to go be somebody's husband, a father, right. a community member. Right. And I, I really believe that if they, man, if they wanted to, they could be just as cutthroat as these other coaches. Absolutely. Snatching scholarships, snatching scholarships, uh, cussing guys out. But they understand, man, that, man, when you verbally abuse a player, man, man, you got guys now walking around 35, 40, 45 years of age, man, who are still wounded yeah, you do. from some of the things their coaches told them. Absolutely, absolutely. So, now, so, so to me, man, it, it ain't just about having a black coach. No, man, I want to get a coach who's going to respect these young men and young women and treat them like such. No matter what, I got you. So now, coach, I'm coach. Excuse me, yes, Doctor Mo, Coach, Doctor Moore, you coaching too? You He's building, coach. you building men and women. You, you know. <laughs> uh, so, hey, you yep. know, I'm used to talking to coaches. Uh, I call everybody a coach. So now, you also do a lot of work. Uh, like we like we mentioned earlier, you do a lot of work with black student athletes, but you mostly focus yeah. on black. And I shouldn't say mostly. You focus a lot of attention on black male athletes. So now, statistically, yeah, yep. Wait, I'm sorry. Statistically, Wait, I'm sorry. black male athletes' graduation rates are very low compared to other demographics. But Absolutely. believe it or not, compared to African American non athletes. The graduation right. rates of athletes are much higher than those who aren't athletes. And, of course, a lot of that yep. is attributed to uh, having a little bit more financial security with the scholarships and things Absolutely. of that nature. Absolutely. What, what do you do then? How do you combat that? Because there's also a misconception that black athletes, of course, you know, you got the dumb jock syndrome or, or – or, right. Uh, you have athletes who are just not completing school. How do you combat that? How do you then build into your students? How do you then let them know that, look, yes, you have a demanding schedule. Yes, although they are not paying you, you are an employee of this university, and Absolutely. there are demands right. on you that aren't necessarily fair. But you can still right. empower yourself. How do you empower those athletes and let them understand you still have an opportunity to do great things, put into yourself, and go be great? Man, what I've learned, man, is that you got to be real intrusive. You know what I'm saying? You got to, um, you got to get in their business so much that they actually want to fight you. Man, when I was at <laughs> LSU, man, I would go to the dorm and get brothers out of bed. Right. And if you don't believe me, go ask Jamarcus Russell <laughs> and Dwayne Bow and that crew. I would go snatch guys out of bed, man. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, man, you got to be real intrusive, and you really got to deal with them like a coach. You can't give them a lot of options. You see what I'm saying? Because the one thing about an athlete. They're used to being told what to do. You right. know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. So I see a kid like, man, I need to see him off at 930. Okay. And you better be there. And they come in. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? And what it is, man, but a lot of these men, young men, have never, they've never had anybody outside of athletics tell them they could be great academically. Mm, right. They, they're not used to having anybody pour into their life, man. So when they see us coming from a professor, you know, someone who's not concerned about how they do on the field or the court, man, I think it really it really resonates with them. So now that can be taxing. So how do you how do you keep how do you keep yourself encouraged or how do when when you have an athlete that you see the potential in and they don't see it in themselves yep. and they just refuse to grasp what you what you're trying to give them and they just do not do not do not take the to take the steps to do that. How do you stay hey, motivated? Here's what I learned, man. The, the, the word says some water, some plant, but God gets the increase. You okay. see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So sometimes, man, all I'm doing is, uh, you know, sometimes, man, I'm just planting, or sometimes I'm just watering, man. You know what I'm saying? I've had, I've had football players at Texas LSU cuss me out. Right. And then three years later, come up, give me a hug. Okay. You know, guys calling me when they get to the league or 
or once the playing days. Because what they realize is that – here's what I tell them, man. I'd be like, hey, man, I don't need you to like me at 19. I want you to respect me when you get 25. Absolutely. And when brothers get away from that athletic industrial complex and begin to reflect, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. On who are the people that were genuinely interested in them, I'm sure my name comes up somewhere. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So now I know you got to get out of here. Oh my God, just got a few more questions for you. So now, go ahead. You yes, also, um, you are director of studying abroad, and I know that you yes, have a, a, a position about uh, taking students, taking students to study abroad during their summers, and them 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 being productive with their summers. You know, you even were quoted as saying, yeah, man. we can't go work at Academy and, 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 and brew wings. <laughs> we got to go out there. Of course, we got to run while they walk. So tell us a little bit about right. that because program man, and what you strive to man, do with that. I mean, here's what it is. Here's what it is, man. It ain't enough just to get to college, man. I think too often the conversation is the black community getting there and graduating. But I'm talking about, man, how do you leave, man, with options? Mm-hmm. And so we tell kids three things. Come to UT major in something you find interesting let's help you do something impactful with your life it ain't all about you and number two let's help you make some money so for us man we realize that the world is global right, right. and one thing i realized man everybody got good grades right 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 right, right. <laughs> so everybody got good grades you see what i'm saying mm-hmm. so that i don't think that is the way to success anymore we're in a totally different economy and the economy is now is based on what skills you bring to the table and what have you done and so what we started man about seven years ago man we started taking these uh, kids abroad, mostly black and brown. We got a program in Beijing, China. We got a program in Cape Town, South Africa. And shoot, hopefully two weeks, keep, keep my fingers crossed, you know, we're going to launch our program in Dubai. We got to see what's going on with, with that virus. But the point right. is, man, well, check this out, man. When you get black kids who've had to adapt already in a majority white environment, right. taking those black kids abroad is not hard. Okay. Because, man, we used to adapting. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. 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 <laughs> we used to code switching. So now I'm just telling you, you can code switch in London, you can code switch in South Africa, you can code switch in Australia, you can code switch in China. And what we find, man, is that when we take these kids abroad, these black kids from Houston, from Madison and Yates, all right, schools like that, man, they thrive over there in that environment. And the research says that when those kids get back from studying abroad, they have the, the highest, the, the next semester, they have their best semester academically than they've ever had in their life. And, man, what it does for their confidence level and for the opportunities, man, you can't put a price tag on it. So, so now, I, I, yep. and, and, and I, by no means am I trying to start <laughs> anything, but how much, how much pushback do you get from, like, colleagues and, and people of a different hue, as we call them? Well, people, uh, I mean, particularly – I mean, and also black colleagues, Go too. Call I it imagine out. imagine that, too. But, man, you know what, man? I, I learned early, and when I was at LSU in the fall of 1998, man, I wrote a letter to the president. My first year as a faculty member, I wrote a letter to the president basically letting them know that they were running a, that they were running a plantation over there in mm-hmm. terms of football. Mm-hmm. Bro, told them. The brothers weren't graduating. They were getting in trouble off the field, but nobody seemed to care as long as they were winning the football game. Right. So I said that because, man, throughout my career, man, I've always understood that God has just wired me a little differently. You see what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Absolutely. <laughs> and people say, well, man, you're going to get fired. You're going to run out of here. Well, man, sometimes there, there are consequences, and I don't deny that. You see what I'm saying? But, you know, I've been called radical. I've been called crazy. I've been called a lot of things, but nobody has ever called me a liar. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Right. So, 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 and so uh, me, go ahead, go ahead. I'm no, sorry. no, no, no. Continue, continue, please. No, for me, man, I'm, I'm going to be strong. I mean, that's just me, but I don't think there's anything I'm doing that's in conflict with the mission of the university. Of course. Have you ever received any death threats? Not quite that Why far. Would I? Not extreme. Not Check, that extreme. Out, Check this out. If, if, let, let's say, let's say you don't like black people. All right. And let's uh-huh. say you just want your LSU Tigers to win football games. Okay. Okay. If these brothers can stop smoking weed, hmm. if they can go to class and be a little bit more disciplined, ain't that going to help you win more? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So what I did was I basically, I mean, coaches, man, are so elementary in their thinking. You feel me? All they care about is recruiting and winning. That's all they care about. That's it. 
they not they not deep thinkers. You feel me? Right, right. So and so you know I go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. You can finish. No, and so man, it's it's so people think I'm radical, but if I'm a, if I'm a head football coach and athletic director, man, I want a bunch of Dr. Moore's around here. You know why? Because I may not be able to connect with them, but I know Dr. Moore can. Right. So that that, that ties right into my question. Um, I was watching one of your videos. You were talking about how you go to different athletic departments and uh, work with them, contract with them to do different things on diversity. Um, but one of your major mm-hmm. points was that um, you have to be proactive about it because once you're on ESPN, it's too late. Um, and so late. I just was wondering how are most of them receptive to your your questions or coming in and having full <laughs> access? Do they kind of shoot you on on just African-American uh, students only or – how does that work? I mean, that's all I want. That's, that's all I want to work with. <laughs> and, but, and here's the deal, man. So, you know, we started this Black Student Athlete Conference about five years ago. We had about 500 people in town this year. Jamel Hill was the keynote speaker. You can see my interview with her on YouTube. Mm-hmm. But anyway, man, here's the deal, man. These athletic directors understand that the black athlete is the lifeblood of their operation. Right. And so I remember, man, the reason I started the conference, because I would have all these athletic directors call me, they're like, Dr. Moore, uh, our alumni is upset, guys got gold teeth and tattoos, I don't know what to do. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Now, with that being said, oh, no, 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 continue, please. No, I was at an SEC school doing some some work uh, with with the football team, and uh, (laughs) This, they were upset. This one brother kept flunking drug tests. Well, you know what that brother told me? What's that? He said, Dr. Moore, they, they started recruiting me when I was 15. I was smoking weed then, and I'm going <laughs> to smoke it now, and they ain't going to change who I am. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, yes, no. indeed. Okay. Well, uh, being that you're an alumnus of uh, Jackson State, which is my father's yep. uh, uh, alumni also, uh, he's an alumnus of okay. Jackson State, and I grew up going back and forth to games and everything, and I remember when – the talent level and the swack and the MEAC was so much higher. So with what I yep. mentioned earlier about uh, this push for black athletes, I mean, because you've had a couple, you've had a couple of three-star recruits to sign with Southern uh, this past season. Right. Uh, things like that are going on. Um, do you think that that is a good avenue and uh, that if, if, if these top-rated uh, recruits go there and these schools start winning, there will be no other choice. What do you think for uh, the NCAA to allow these guys to be uh, Division One in FBS schools? Let me tell you the same thing I told Jamel Hill because she wrote an article about, you know, these athletes going to HBCUs. You know what I told her? Mm-hmm. We can't expect 17- and 18-year-olds to make sacrifices that mm-hmm. 45-year-olds don't want to make. Huh. I got you. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's a lot to put that on them. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it is. That's like – you know, finding a sister that works at AT and T said, "Well, I need you to work for a black-owned phone company." Right. You, know, you know what I'm saying? Or even, even in my case, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Case, don't get me—I I like working at the University of Texas because I got resources and the impact can be bigger. You know right. what I'm saying? Right, right, right. But um, but but that's just the reality, man. I think we're asking these young men and women. Uh, I mean, if you, when you and all HBCU programs aren't equal, let me say that. I think that I think that needs to be clarified as well. But, man, when you talk to some of these kids about their experience at HBCUs as an athlete, it ain't the best. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so we've been, man, promoting that HBCU. We've been promoting that nurturing environment stuff for the last 80, 90 years. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It was nurturing to me. <laughs> yeah, but some of these kids this. now say, Doc, it ain't, it ain't like it was when you were there. You know what I'm saying? So I think every HBCU is, every HBCU is different, man. I think it all depends on who the coach is and who the athletic director is. So what's the future as far as HBCUs go in this entire equation? Uh, do you think that they serve a purpose Man. or if they'll wither away? Uh, uh, athletically? Athletically and academically because, I mean. Oh, academically, I mean, academically we serve a purpose. Athletically, I don't even know, to be honest with you, man, I think we're spending too much money on athletics, man. Mm-hmm. If it was up to me, I think all this, like the swag and me actually go Division three, quit giving us scholarships because, man, we're putting too much money – we're taking too much money from the academic side of campus and putting it over in athletics. Really? You know what I'm saying? Because I would, say that the, I would say that the athletic departments are the ones generating the revenue for the school. Oh, man. <laughs> over there. 
Uh, they not man. They not. They not. No, not. They not generating much of what the people think they are. You okay. know, most, you know, most athletic departments run a deficit. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what right, I'm saying? Right. 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 But yeah. my thing is this: I'm gonna go watch Jackson State play Southern, whether it's D2, D3, NAIA. Right. Division one stuff doesn't. It doesn't matter to me. Right. And I think the HBCU piece has always been, at least the last twenty years, more cultural, cultural than anything else. Yeah. You right. Know? Yeah. It's a yeah. Party. I mean, but you got Hampton, you got Norfolk State, you got these schools trying to go uh, FBS. Do you think that's a huge waste of time for schools like this? Now, who's doing it? Hampton, A and T, doing it, right? Now, yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. Got, they, I, and I think they Norfolk got a State also. around. They, they got a Roman around ten thousand students. They may be able to sustain it. You okay. see what I'm saying? Right, because of the population. Like, because most of the black schools, if they got yeah. five thousand, they're doing good, right? Yeah, and a lot of the two, three, four thousand. Yeah, you know, Fam, Jackson State, Hampton. Those are the bigger ones. But Jackson State's enrollment now is down to like seven thousand students. Yeah, My thing is, man, we love the band and all that stuff, but you can't keep taking resources from the academic side and putting it in the football. Okay. Especially when it's not enough coming in in the whole pie anyway. Yeah, understood. Because I mean, I mean, you know, most of the, and and then the way they have to travel is that sort of. Uh, when you talk to these athletes and they say they've had bad experiences, is it the bus rides and the constantly being I think on the, the road? Football, I think with the football piece is, 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 is playing those games, man, against those power five schools where they get beat up. The money games. Guys get injured. The money games. Yeah. They had that brother from Southern got paralyzed when they played Georgia. Yeah. yeah you know, and then if yeah. you think about the, the basketball side, you know, these guys, they first 15 games on the road. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. How do those kids go to class? Kids, Right, how are they what managing their class a little bit on the road the first I, 15 yeah, games? Because we follow Texas Southern basketball heavy That's because they've been really successful over the last few years uh, relative, you know, right. to With to their model. stature. And, uh, I mean, right, right. like you said, first 15, 20 games are on the road. <laughs> uh, so it's got to be impossible. I mean, they're they going from coast to coast. Oh, yeah. They're just traveling. They're going, <laughs> they going the everywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> it's got to be impossible right. to keep – yeah, not only are you going there and losing by 25 every night, <laughs> but how do you keep track of your studies with that kind of schedule, man? It's impossible. Right. No, it is tough, man. And and my thing is, man, I mean, I, I'm just big on doing what you do well. You know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. man? HBCUs do, man, we, we prepare people for life, man. You know what I'm saying? Right. We take folk who nobody else wants, who nobody says has any value. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, I, you know, so I'm, I'm just really big on us, man, peeling some of that athletic stuff back. Right. Because you're not going to be able to compete with these other schools. Never, <laughs> never. So uh, do you have any colleagues at other schools who are implementing and, and, and working with athletes the way you are? Are you trying to spread this well, man, program? No, I mean, what we've done, man, you know, my, with this conference, man, like I said, my goal was to play long football. See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm a chess kind of guy. Mm-hmm. And so what we found, man, we had our first conference 2015, 2016. Some of the people who've been coming to the conference every year have just gotten athletic director jobs. A lot of them are number two positions around the country. And what our conference has done, man, it may now, you know, now athletic directors can talk openly about the black athlete. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because before they were scared to. You know what I'm saying? But I had to tell these athletic directors, you know, the black kid at TCU on the football team, his experience is a lot different than the white kid on the football team. Very much so. You know, with, with, with Dr. Moore, I don't see color. Well, I need you to see color. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because they don't have the alumni network. I mean, the whole experience is different. And so we just had to do a lot of educating, man, with athletic directors. And here's the thing, man, athletic directors, man, they get it. They could do more. And I remember I was, I was at a conference talking to an athletic director from the Big Ten. Here's what I asked. I said, why don't you demand that every student athlete have a resume and every student athlete, you know, um, get an internship? You know you know what AD told me, man, and it was so profound? What's that? He said, Dr. Moore, if I tell those coaches how to run their team, if they start losing and I'm ready to fire him, the first thing they would say is, well, uh, the athletic director was meddling. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? If I didn't have to do all this other stuff, we win. And so that's why a lot of athletic directors are kind of hands off. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that's why I say, man, the coach has all the power. When you see these athletes who can't function in society, that ain't the university's fault. That's the coach's fault. Mm. So now. Yeah. So I mean, and I have, go ahead. That's the coach's fault. It ain't the university's fault. That's the coach's fault. 
because the coach has all the power, and every student athlete knows that playing time is currency. Whatever that coach tells them to do, they will do. Absolutely, because <laughs> they want playing time. So, yeah. <laughs> so now I know you're 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 an, an, a strong advocate of authenticity, and and yes, of course. You know, like anybody in life, we all have to conform to some some extent. So how do you okay. so how do you encourage students to or what is your position on on, on first off on uh, appearance versus authenticity authenticity? What I mean by that is, you know, you have some people who who just you get along <laughs> to get along and you know even though there might be some things that they may not necessarily like they're trying to take advantage of the opportunity so they can get what they can get and then go back to their communities and make a difference versus they're embracing right. and, and, and letting all of their personality shine <laughs> how do you what is your right. position on that and and how do you and what do you encourage students to do here's what i tell them uh, I, I've spent a lot of time in black communities growing up, like either through our church, nationally, relatives, and all that, all right? Here's what I tell them. What I could do in Cleveland, Ohio, I couldn't do in South Central L.A. when I went to visit my relatives for the summer. Mm -hmm. okay. I had to put all the red clothes. I, I had to put all the, I had, I had to leave all the red clothes in Cleveland. Right, <laughs> right, 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 absolutely. Because I couldn't walk around looking like a blood in a crypt neighborhood. So right. the one thing I tell people, man, is you got to understand what environment you are in. And I don't think it's selling out. I don't think it's being inauthentic. I think it's, man, okay, I'm in this environment for a season of my life. You know what I'm saying? This is sort of the culture of this environment. Let me understand the culture and let me pimp it out, then I'll be on my way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Amazing. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've enjoyed this interview so much, and I hope you can come and, and absolutely, and, and, and man. I wish we had more time, time, man. I got one more question absolutely. before you go. Go ahead, because, man. I got about five more minutes. Go ahead, man. Okay, cool. Because I okay now yeah. we talked about lowering the standards, right? Uh, at these schools, right. particularly when you were speaking about your daughter going off to an Ivy League school, as good of a student as she right. was, you know, can she handle it? So right. I know that uh, service academies, right? The, Air Force Academy, yep. Naval Academy, all those places have prep schools, right, where right. if they have to take a kid like that who they really want gifted athletically but don't think he'll so much acclimate to that environment of the military school right off the bat, they'll send him to prep school for a year. Do you think that's right. an investment right. that a lot of these um, uh, Division I uh, FBS schools can make to keep these kids uh, for the whole four years, because like you say, it's better if they're there the whole four years. It's better if they're not going to jail. It's all, it's better for the whole university. Do you think that's something that they can invest in possibly? I don't know, man. Um, I mean, some some people just aren't, aren't some people just ain't cut out to be at a major university. That's just mm -hmm. reality. You know what I'm saying? Some people just ain't. It's too it's too big of a it's too big of a, a cultural shift for some people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, man? When I went to Ohio State for grad school. So listen to this, man. Jackson State, this 89 and 93, we had one computer lab on campus. <laughs> man, it closed at, it, it closed at 4 o'clock every day like it was a bank. All right, <laughs> right, right, right. Man, man, I get to Ohio State, man, and they, they told me the computer lab was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, man, you could reserve a computer like any time of day. Right, right, right. right, right you know right, what I'm right. saying? So, man, just it's just – I mean, so – I think sometimes for some people, man, just the, just the gap is too wide. You see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Right. It's just too wide. You know what I mean? But um, but talking about lowering the standards academically, man, you know, I, um, it seems unfair, doesn't it? And, 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 yeah, and I always so. give an example. Let's say you got a kid at USC, all right, a kid from South Central L.A. who goes to play football at USC, a very competitive school academic. Very think about so. this, man. The smartest kid that that dude knows in high school probably applied to USC and didn't get in. Right. All right? All right. <laughs> but now he shows up with his 900 SAT, <laughs> but he's surrounded in the classroom with people with 14 to 1500. He's intimidated mm -hmm. because he knows the only reason he's there is because of football. That's why you see these brothers walking around campus with, hood, with hoods on. You know what I'm saying? Trying to hide. It's what we call in psychology the imposter syndrome. Right. They sit They sit in the back of class. Yeah. And I'd be like, man, how come we ain't speaking up? They say, Doc, man, I don't want to say something stupid. You see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Because they know that their cousin applied to Texas or Michigan or Ohio State and didn't get in, but they got in. Right. 
Absolutely. And they like, man, my cousin was the one helped me with my homework. Right, 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 right. He was right, the one that was going to make it. Right, exactly. right, 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 right. Oh, you well, know what I'm saying? And so if, if you come in academically, you know what I'm saying, when you can't compete, then the stuff on the field or the court ain't going the way you want it to go. You, you know what the result is. Substance yeah. abuse, bad decisions. Right. You know what I mean? Right, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So that's Dr. Moore, Vice President of the Diver Diversity and Communication, excuse me, Diversity and Community Engagement at the University of Texas. Man, I wish we had more time. I got so many questions I want to talk let me, about. Let, let, let me, can, I ask, can I ask you all a question, man? Absolutely. Let me ask you, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, all right, man? I didn't know a whole lot about University of Texas till I came here, you know. Oh, you know, coach, you better open a can, <laughs> coach. Here's, you better so, open so, one. So here's my question, man. How how is the University of Texas just perceived by the majority of Black folk across the state or in Houston? Uh, well, I, I, all I can do is well, well look, we'll, like, we'll do it like this. We'll take turns speaking on this because I know there's okay. there is right. a range of uh, uh, opinions here. For me. Being a being at the time when I was playing ball, we all expired to go play for the University of Texas. However, the perception okay. of the campus is very poor in the black community. Number one is because it is mm. they have historically always been very uh, oppressive and 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 biased okay. towards black students, black athletes. Of course, they still have okay. the the stain of the the mass shooting. From the uh, right. uh, from 60s. the from the tower, and so yeah, and you know they were one of the last universities to integrate. So uh, that's true uh, football, you're right. Yeah, football. So here in Texas, yes, as a black athlete wanting to play sports, yes, it was, it's 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 frowned. It was frowned upon. Then there was a point where yes, everybody wanted to go there. And now I think now it's kind of going back because they're also realizing, hey, I can go be great other places. Right. Okay. And and, okay. and, and okay. for me growing up, um uh just around is looked at as very elitist. Hell number yeah. one. Yeah. Very yeah. elitist. Okay. Uh if you go up there you better be playing football or something because ain't no other black folk up there. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> right there. I told you what my cousin said, yeah. Doc. I said, you know, he was like 50,000 students. I don't know nothing about that. Yeah. It's about 5,000 <laughs> students because all the black kids stay together. <laughs> exactly. And me, actually, uh, I started getting in the University of Texas when James Brown and Sean Mitchell and Ricky Williams is freshman year. And I was rooting for UT. Okay. And my friends used to clown me about it. Yeah. Because yeah. you rooting for oh. the white folks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Actually, the black kids and, you know, my contemporary black kids, because uh, I'm 39 now, they rooted, uh, and their parents rooted for A&M more so than they rooted for UT. Because of wow. the, uh, okay. and, and A&M, I mean, you know, that's looked at as, quote, unquote, the redneck school. Oh, yeah. But yeah. still, right. it was more accessible than those rich folk, those T-sips up at UT. So very <laughs> negative, I would say. And I would say it's still like that. And it seems to be getting worse as when kids apply there now, they're sending kids off to these to UTSA, to UTA, to UT El Paso, and not letting a whole lot of kids on the Austin campus, in my opinion. So, Let, can I speak on that for a quick minute? Yes, Please sir. do. Let me say this, man. I think well, I, I'll say this, and 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 the hard you heard me, you heard me speak at the at the event, man. Um, at least from my vantage point, things are changing. Because what I told people is that there's no way I'm going to work at a university that I wouldn't want my kids to go to. Right. So over the last 10, 12 years, man, we really, really built up a very awesome, I would say, uh, awesome infrastructure for, for black students. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And is, the, is it perfect? No, not at all. Now, do we have a lot of black folk? No, we about 5%. But I will say this, the 5% that are there, they are well taken care of. My wife runs a program for black women. She just took 30 sisters to Wall Street, uh, did, did a company tour for five days back in January. They're having a retreat next weekend where about 140 undergraduate sisters will be at. We do a lot for black males. Um, I mean, there's just a lot going on there. You know what I'm saying? So the numbers aren't large, but I tell people that if you look at our peer institutions, Ohio State, Washington, UCLA, Michigan, Wisconsin, places like that, other large universities, uh, the, the, the infrastructure for black students at Texas is, is unparalleled, and you can't find it anywhere else in the country. And secondly, as it relates to the admissions piece, can, can, I, can I try to break this down to y'all real quick? Please, Please do. 
Okay. All right. So you know we have the, the Texas has a top ten percent rule, mm-hmm. but at Texas top six percent, right? Right. Now the reason Texas was allowed to move away from top ten is because if they would have kept it top ten percent, the entire freshman class would have been nothing but automatic admits. That's it. The mm. entire freshman class. You could mm. you you could fill up eight eighty five hundred students with just the top ten percent. Right. All right. And so what that did, that excluded people who were super sharp, talented, but who were just outside the top 10%. Right, right? Right. And the other dilemma is the number of kids in Texas. Texas, is the only, Texas and Florida are the only two states where the, the high school graduating classes are getting larger every year. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. There's, right. there's been a drain, brain drain for the Midwest, Northeast, and the West Coast. Mm-hmm. So Texas, the graduating classes just get larger every single year. So I like the auto admit piece, but does it squeeze people? Without a doubt. Without a doubt, it squeezes people. But I'm going to tell you why I like it, because at least you know what what the automatic admission standard is. Right. You know what I'm saying. Now, some people don't like it. I kind, I kind of like it because people at least need, need to know what to shoot for. But mm-hmm. I'll tell you this, man. If you have five people who complain about not getting into UT, I can show you 50 phone calls from wealthy people who complain about their kid not getting Of course, kids. absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Well, they can go to SMU. They can afford it. They can afford it. So, um, but you, said, you, said, you, said, you said they can go to SMU? I said, you yeah. I said, they can go to SMU. They can afford it. You know, hey, hey, SMU and TCU are they financially to, they, uh, selective, you know? I got you. No, but it's a tough piece, man. And like I said, man, the place is not perfect. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know, like, like we, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff, man, to try to change the culture. Let me tell you this about the president, man. Anytime you got a president who will pull down Confederate statues in the middle of the night mm-hmm. and the school is just less than a mile from the state capitol, that's the kind of president I want to work for. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. But he gets it because his dad was a Holocaust survivor. You feel uh-huh. me? Right, 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 <laughs> which, which goes a long yeah. way. Yeah. So um, he gets it, right? We do, right? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was just gonna continue on. Nine. Um, I have a totally different view um, of UT. I was one of the. My brother went to UT. Um, Ernest McGowan. Okay. You might know him. Yeah, he knows you, Doctor Ernest McGowan. Um, and so I grew up. Yeah, I know him. I grew yeah. up loving UT. I grew up as UT being the the major school in the state, obviously, and the bell cow, the one that you want to go to. Um, and so. Mm-hmm. I've seen it, the people I deal with, I went to UTSA, however, and so okay, the view is a little bit different coming from UTSA because a lot of those people wanted to attend UT, and as we just discussed earlier, were unable to get in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say as a whole, coming from the younger community, there are certain, there are several people that do still see it as the school of choice. Um, it's yeah. just they have a... Like a skewed view upon the whole city and the university. I would say the city has a lot to do with it as well. Yeah, whole lot. A lot of people okay. have no idea the gym that Austin truly is until they get down there. And right, right, right. No, but a lot of us don't care about the next singer songwriter either. But on Sixth Street, it, <laughs> that's <laughs> part of the problem. Right. You don't have to. No, and, and like I said, it ain't, it ain't perfect, man. But you know, I, I think I, you know, I think there's a. You know, a lot of progress being made. We've got to make sure, you know, it, it's, it's sustainable. You know what I'm saying? Right. But, uh, you know, it, it, you know, it's a cool place to be, man, you know. And so for me, man, I typically visit 35 high schools a year. You know what I'm saying? I got to tell you this one story, man. Now, what's the name of this? Is there like a health science academy in Houston? Yes. Yeah, DeBecky. Is there, is, there, is, there, is, there, is there Barbara Jordan School? Is there Barbara Jordan Barbara School? Barbara Jordan Barbara School, school of Careers. Careers. Yeah. Absolutely. What's it called? The Barbara Jordan School of Careers. Actually, they've changed it now. It's the Barbara Jordan uh, oh, business career. center, right, career right, right. center. No, the okay. Barbara Jordan Career Center. So, man, man, you got you got to hear this one story. So I go, you know, visiting students, right? You right. know, and I remember, was it? I think it was Barbara Jordan or some other school. I walked in, and uh, they said, "You from UT?" I said, "Yeah," and they said, "Well, the football coach's office is that way." <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, man, UT. Man, listen, you want to stay place, certain places. Yeah, but no, yeah. even the football. Right, but no, I said no. I'm just here. To, I'm just here to recruit students. I ain't gonna do it athletic. Wow. But, uh, pre- 
Appreciate y'all, brothers, man. If y'all ever in Austin, man, you know, come, uh, you know, look me up, man. Give me a holler or something like that. We'd love to show you around campus some of the things we got going on. We Absolutely, definitely will. We, 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 we definitely will. And can you uh, possibly join us again at some other? Absolutely, because I gotta ask you about this Trumpism class, man. I got. We will. I, 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 I need to know about that. So, be, uh, tell first off, tell hey, the audience what some things you got going on. <laughs> how they can reach you if they want to look you up. Yeah, your social media. I see your Twitter page. Yeah, man. I'll. I got man, you know, I, I got a small Twitter. I'm not a big social media guy. You know what I'm saying? You Maybe I'm be. just on <laughs> two in that regard. Uh, and, and another thing, man, because I, you know, I, I I say things that if you don't understand the context or if you ain't in the room, they could be seen as controversial. You know uh, what I'm saying? Ain't nothing wrong with that, Doc. And I just and I just know, man, we in a culture now where people take four or five things you say. You know what I'm saying? And right, just run with it, man. So I really just like dealing with people. You know, in a in a personal setting, you know, whether it was a classroom lecture or something like that, man. But uh, but no, no man, you just you know, just find me, shoot me an email or something like that, and we would love to, we love to connect with y'all down the line, man. Absolutely, absolutely, man. Thank you for coming on. That's Dr. Leonard Moore, Vice President of the Diversity and Community Engagement Division at the University of Texas, man. Dr. Moore, I appreciate you, man. It was awesome. Thank you, man. Uh, 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 good luck with everything you have going on, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you soon, man. Appreciate you, man. Have a good evening. You have a good night, too, Doc. Follow the Garage Department on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Email, tweet, photos, videos, Let me share some real quick. Follow me on social media. And subscribe to the Garage Department Radio on YouTube.